I'm Alexander Rose, the Executive Director here at Long Now. I'm joined today from British Columbia by our speaker, Dr. Suzanne Samard. Suzanne has developed revolutionary new techniques for discovering the way trees, even between species, are able to articulate their needs within the forest. Welcome, Dr. Suzanne Samard. Hello, it's an honor for me to be here. My name is Dr. Suzanne Samard. Um, I'm a professor at the University of British Columbia and a researcher. I'm here to talk to you today about mother trees and how I discovered their importance in forests and how they contribute sort of to what I'm calling the wisdom of the forest. So before I start, I just want to acknowledge, first of all, that I am giving this talk and most of my research is on the unceded territory of a number of First Nations here in Canada. I'm actually in Nelson, British Columbia right now on the unceded territory of the Tanaha, the Sinaiaks and the Okanagan nations. When I do my work in Vancouver, which is where I teach and where my university is, um, the, that is the territories of the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh and the Squamish First Nations. In British Columbia, there are almost all of the territories unceded territory. So it's very important for us to acknowledge the land on which we live. I'm actually a settler. I come from a settler family, but I work with First Nations and their wisdom has contributed enormously to what I'm about to tell you today. Um, and also to all of our livelihoods and will be in our future. And I think that you'll, <laughs> you'll see that as I go through my talk. So I'm, I'm going to give you some context, like what drove me to do the research I did. My own background as a, a child of British Columbia, and I grew up here in a logging family, a horse logging family. I grew up in forests that were are called inland rainforests. These are amazing forests. They're what you would call biodiversity hotspots in the world. They're also hotspots for carbon storage. And they're also the source of our clean air and our clean water here in British Columbia. And it flows all the way down through, through North America. So the value of these forests is beyond anything we imagined even 50 years ago. Now we understand, you know, how crucial they are in our global world and the changing global world. So I grew up in these places and my research really started from when I was a child and it's just moved forward in trying to understand how they work and how we can, how we, we can honor them and their wisdom to help us to live in a happy and healthy environment. When my family came to North America, they eked out a living and they did it through selective harvesting. So that what that means is that they would take out you know, certain species and certain sizes of trees and then left the forest to regenerate itself. There was no planting back then. It was just that the, the logging was such a light touch that the trees were able to reseed into these small gaps created by the harvesting and then become a forest. It just seemed like that my grandfather and my uncles were all part of the forest and the forest grew up around them and we grew up around the forest. And so that's how I got to know it. So everything was very labor intensive and very, very, very slow. And that's so important because as they did this work, it was a very light touch on the landscape. It was very much, you know, you just take what you need and then leave the rest. This is a photo here of my grandfather and my uncles on what's called a it's a log boom in what was called the Skookum Chuck Narrows on the Shushwap River. They were regularly crushed in these logging adventures and they would have to break up these log jams with dynamite. They would lose their hands, their fingers. Almost all of my uncles and grandfathers and great uncles had missing fingers. It was pretty exciting way to grow up. And so I actually followed in my grandfather's footsteps when I was uh, in my teens, you know, girls weren't actually in, allowed to go into forestry. We were, um, you know, we were supposed to go into nursing or education or something. And so um, it was kind of an unusual pathway for me. And I was really lucky at the time that, that UBC, where, where I went to university, had just opened its doors to girls. And I was able to start out doing forestry. And this is me when I'm in my early 20s working for a logging company. So that would have been in the late 70s and then the early 80s. The whole logging practices had shifted. And they shifted from this small scale horse logging family operations to big industrial clear cutting. And so that's how I started out my career is, is 
looking at big industrial clear cutting, which was so different than what, how I'd grown up. And right now in British Columbia, we're really grappling with the fact that we only have 3% of our iconic old growth rainforest left. Going back to my own neighborhood, my own, where I grew up, this is the Shishwap River where my grandparents, the Samard family had homesteaded, but it had become a place of clear cutting as well. And that you can imagine the impact that would have had. And the changes are cumulative and we're seeing that signature on the landscape now. This is, an, is actually a picture taken about 15 years ago of what our landscape looks like. So I grew up in a, in a landscape of old growth forests. British Columbia, Western Canada, is, and I would say of the West of, of the United States as well, has shifted from a landscape of old growth forests to a landscape of clear cuts with only small pockets of old growth forests that are left. There are huge implications for that. We've converted these old growth forests to plantations. And this is what these plantations look like. Clear cutting means taking away all of the trees and then they're replanted to one or two species. In this case, Douglas fir, this is a monoculture, meaning one species. And then they're cultivated or weeded and tended to get rid of all the other, or as many of the other plants as possible to favor these trees. With the idea being that if you get rid of the native plants, then all those resources will be available to grow big fat trees. Of course, as I moved along in my career, I, I eventually became a researcher and one of my jobs was to figure out how to grow plantations. And then if there's something wrong with them, what the heck is wrong with them and what can we do about it? And as I started working on this and at the time in the early 90s, I was working in the Ministry of Forests, the government, and that was also when the mountain pine beetles started coming through. And we started noticing that in these plantations, so this is a plantation of lodgepole pine in a subboreal spruce forest where the beetle has specifically attacked and killed those planted lodgepole pines. And why is that the case? Well, the problem here is that it was planted one species in a sea of a multi-species forest. And so it was like a had a target on its back for the beetle. It was exactly what the beetle wanted, was a simplified forest that had been weeded to grow bigger, faster lodgepole pines that were the host to the beetle. And I've done many studies since then to show that we have like about 50 different damaging agents in these kinds of forests now that are basically chewing their way through. And as climate is warming up, we found that it's getting worse and worse. I started to do some research on what's going on in the soil. So there are big pathogens that were killing forests and a lot of those big pathogens attack big roots of old trees. But we were also noticing trees dying in plantations, of course. And so I went back to school to try to figure out what had we done to create this imbalance in the soil and among these fungi that would make the forest more vulnerable. And so I was looking at a smaller subset of fungi of mycorrhizas. And these fungi, they're mutualists. That means that they help the trees grow. They don't decay them, they don't infect them, or they don't cause them to decline. And so I started studying this in our forests. The first work that I, I did on looking at connections and communications between trees is I started with a complex system. A simpler system would be to work with one species. But I was working with two because I was interested in how we were manip manipulating these species. And I worked with three, actually I worked with Douglas fir, paper birch, and western red cedar, which are all native species in my forest. And Douglas fir is the one that foresters want because it brings top dollar. Paper birch is considered a weed, and so it's actively managed against. It's actually weeded out of forests using herbicides and anything we can get our hands on to get rid of that pesky plant because it's supposedly stealing from Douglas fir resources, light, water, and so on. And then the third species was western red cedar, which of course is a, a really valuable species for lots of reasons, but in, to foresters it wasn't at that time. It was considered a pesky species. Even though our First Nations consider it, they actually call it the tree of life. Um, because of all of the benefits it provides to ecosystems as well as people. But, but in the forestry world at the time, it was considered a weed as well. But I used the three species to look at communication and connection because they all had different roles in the ecosystem. And through many years of studies with my students and, and others, determined that throughout our forests, throughout the world, that trees depend on these mycorrhizas and that these plants actually are networked together into a single unit by these fungi that 
all of the trees all over the world with their mycorrhizal fungi actually are connected together. We are also able to detect defense enzymes and how when you, a tree is injured, like a mother tree gets attacked by the mountain pine beetle, what kind of messages is that tree sending to, to neighboring seedlings? And so we're able to actually detect these enzymes that end up uh, in the neighboring plants and how the, the RNA and the DNA is upregulated in response to the, those enzymes so that these neighboring plants can actually upregulate and produce their own defense enzymes as well. At the time, there was a lot of skepticism about this. I published a paper in Nature that went into what these connections meant to the forest. And there was a lot of skepticism that, that these things didn't actually exist in nature or they weren't important. These fungi, you can't see them with the naked eye. Um, even the, a microscope, even though you can see them on the root tips, you can't actually see how these threads move or travel through the soil. And so eventually we got uh, molecular tools where we could actually, you know, identify fungi based, based on their DNA sequences. And we went into a forest of Douglas fir, a, a simple forest, you know, it was a native or primary forest. That means that it had never been logged. And so we went in and we wanted to map the fungi and the trees. In this map, the circles in the frag gear represent trees. And the bigger the circle, the, the bigger the tree. And the darker the circle, the older the tree. So the oldest trees in this little forest are about 300 years old. And the youngest trees, which are the little yellow circles in the middle, are about 10 years old. And so it's a multi-age forest based on this figure. So we call those uneven age forests. And you can see that there's about 60 trees in this forest. Um, and then the lines that are linking these different circles or these trees together are the fungal genus or the individual fungi of two species that we were tracking. And these two sister species we're basically linking all of the trees together. And the biggest oldest tree, which is up in the upper right hand corner of the figure, was actually of the 60 trees was linked to 47 other trees. And so it turned out that every tree was linked to every other tree through a series of hop, skips and jumps. And so this map alone just completely transformed how people were viewing forests at the time, which was that trees were individuals that that competed for resources and that competition isn't the only thing that's happening in these forests, that there's a lot of collaboration going on in that collaboration. One of the vectors for that collaboration are these mycorrhizal linkages. The one thing to notice is that these little trees, these little yellow seedlings that you can see here, these 10 year olds, when the seed falls from the old trees, these old, big old 300 year old trees, the seed falls to the forest floor, it germinates you know, as soon as it germinates, it, the seed will send a hypocotyl down into the soil, which starts sending signals to the other roots and fungi and critters, bacteria in the soil. There's a huge communication going on, a chemical communication. Basically, they just link into the network of the old trees. They become part of this big woven quilt. Those seedlings suddenly have a huge resource available to them. They've got the resources of their elders. They have, they also, just by having the mycorrhizas, they're able to also access all of the nutrients and water in the soil that these big old trees are able to access as well. You know, it's like inheriting a large bank account as soon as you're born. So the other thing that happens, they get mycorrhizal, but they also start receiving subsidies from these old trees. If they didn't have these subsidies, they would die. They wouldn't make it in the understory of these old trees. It's too shady, it's too dark. They can't photosynthesize enough on their own. And so it's a very dynamic environment throughout the life of these trees. And archived in their tree rings then is that history. They tell a story of the stresses and the riches that come along to a tree throughout their lifetime. Um, eventually these young seedlings themselves grow up to become mother trees themselves. And then they, you know, have tons of resources they can send to their own seedlings. Well, can these old trees do they nurture all the seedlings? Can, can it be a different species? It, it's like a community, right? With all the different people in a community, like my little town of Nelson with all the different people, you know, that have all their professions and we interact in that very fluid way. It's the same thing in the forest with all their specialties. Well, it turns out that these old trees can recognize which ones are their own seedlings. They have kin recognition and that they're able to adjust where they're sending carbon based on the identity of their kin. And so in the process of doing that, they actually favor their own genes. They favor their kin and that carries the line forward. In a real, in a forest, if we were to look at every species of fungi and every network, there would be 
hundreds and the linkages would be so dense and so numerous you wouldn't even be able to to see that it it would be just opaque so what do we do about this other than protesting and chaining ourselves to trees yes by all means let's do that but there's we also need to figure out ways where we can emulate some of these more careful management practices based on being on the land and listening and trying to protect those wonderful resources and all that at the same time as protecting you know biodiversity carbon storage and all while climate is changing and making it harder and harder and harder to do that so how can we help these forests so I started a project about five years ago to try to address some of these things called the Mother Tree Project. The basic idea is taking that basic research on tree communication and connection and applying it in forestry practices so that we can actually look after the basic things that we need in order to have a life on this planet, which means protecting our forests, protecting the carbon stocks that are in those forests, the biodiversity that's in them, and so we wanted to retain mother trees in different amounts and configurations with the idea that we knew that they were essential to regeneration and essential to protecting all the other creatures in the forest. And we also wanted to look at genetic gradients because we knew already that the rate of climate change is so fast, the velocity is so high, that trees cannot migrate as quickly as we need them to in order to retain forests on our earth to retain forested landscape. We're gonna to have to help them migrate. We're gonna to have to help species and genotypes move because we've made it too fast for them to do it on their own. I'm gonna show you some of our early results on this. We focused on one particular forest type, Douglas fir, because it's got this big broad range across British Columbia. So these are undergraduate and graduate students and they are the lifeblood of this, of this project. It's a hundred year project. I'm going to be gone well before it even reached the forest reaches a teenage year. And so they're going to be the ones that are carrying this into the future. Well, this is the biggest experiment I've ever designed. It's probably one of the biggest climate experiments in forests in North America. So we have actually a total of 27 forests that have been treated in different ways where we retain mother trees in different configurations and compare them to an uncut primary forest. So a native forest, and then we've taken that native forest and cut out different patches of trees, leaving these different mother trees in different amounts and configurations. So the 60% means that we, we cut out gaps of trees and left 60% of the mother trees and thinned them from below to try to boost their vigor. And then with the next one, this 30% is we created larger gaps in the forest and left patches of 30%, so just smaller patches. This 10% is what's known as a seed tree method. It's a very common forest harvesting method across Europe and North America, where you leave individual trees. The problem with it is that what we have found across British Columbia anyway, is that about a third of those trees are dead within five years. And that's part of the reasoning behind having these 30 and 60% patches as well to protect the mother trees from dying, from blowing over or just dying from stress or shock from losing its neighbors and its family. We wanted to track the biodiversity, so we measured everything, like the lichens and the mosses, the plants, the trees, the small mammals, the large mammals. We'd like to look at the birds um, and, and also where is all the carbon in those ecosystems. We measured you know, every stick, every plant, every tree. We dug our soils down to a meter and collected soil from all those different depths. We took them back to the lab and we measured all the nitrogen and, and carbon in those samples. And we were able to actually reconstruct the carbon budget for our forest. So all of our 27 sites then had to be harvested by all of our partners, which was a huge undertaking. And then me and my students went out and planted all of our special seedlings in these forests. And now we're going back and evaluating how they look, what the biodiversity is. So one of the things along our big climate gradient is that we know naturally that tree species richness or how many trees are there varies. And sure enough, that's reflected in our data. Where And this also happens worldwide, that when you have replete climates with, with very good climatic conditions, there's more tree species. And then as it gets drier and drier um, and more harsh, you have fewer tree species. And tree species richness is correlated with carbon. But tree species richness isn't the only thing. When we look at the full suite of species, and I'm just talking about plants right now, all through from the top of the trees down into the soil, this is the carbon pools in our forest. 
And so we have, here's our dry forest at the left-hand side of our curve and our wettest uh, climatic region on the far right part of the curve. The brown part of the figure is what's below ground and the green part is the carbon above ground. So here's an amazing thing is that when you're walking through the forest, everything that you see, all the trees, the plants, what's on the ground, that's only half of the carbon. The other half is hidden away from sight below ground. And that is where our really stable carbon pools are. Those are so precious to us with climate change. We can take off the above ground and, and harvest it and, and turn it into toilet paper, but we need to make sure that that below ground pool is really stable and safe in the ground so that we don't double the problem. If you just look at the raw data, what this figure here is showing is that as you increase the number of tree species in plantations, and I'm thinking plantations here, because keep in mind we only plant one or two species because we're very simplistic with our management. We're always keeping that carbon pool low if we do that, right? The reason for that is as you add more species in the ecosystem, they start occupying different niche spaces, above ground and below ground. So above ground, if you look at this nice picture on the diagram. You can see all these different tree species with their have occupied different layers of the canopy. Some of them are photosynthesizing in the upper canopy. Some are shade tolerant and doing it in the lower canopy, but they're occupying or they're, they're accessing or acquiring all those sun rays that are coming in there and converting them into photosynthate. And it's photosynthate that drives the whole below ground processes, all the nutrient cycle, the carbon cycle, the water cycle. And what's going on below ground too, as you add more species of trees, is they too occupy different niches in the soil. And if you start taking species away, you start basically truncating the ability of the ecosystem to acquire resources and be productive. And so by simplifying our ecosystems, and it doesn't matter if it's a forest or a grassland or a cropland, that when we simplify to a few species, we actually lose these niches or we don't occupy them and we lower the productivity of our, of our plant communities. So there's a lesson here for management. Okay, now I'm just going to talk about one last little piece here, and that is what is the effect of leaving these old mother trees on regeneration? And this is just a subset of our regeneration data. So this is really talking about the ability of the forest to recover, right? It's resilience. This is looking at total density of up to three years post-harvesting. And you can see that, you know, in forests that were intact or where we left a lot of the mother trees, there's a lot of regen, right? They're recovering really fast. As we clear cut, we get less and less and less and less. You, well, that seems obvious because there's fewer trees there, but there's just fewer seed around and they're more at risk of dying from frost and drought. And even if they do get established. The other thing here is that the richness of species, so that is the number of species coming back also is greater when we leave more overstory covers. Leaving these mother trees is not just important for density, it's important for the diversity of the species coming back. Along this axis here, the z-axis, is our aridity gradient or our climate gradient. And this is just showing that in a really favorable environments where it's wet and cool, that we get a lot of regeneration. As it gets drier, which is these orange bars in front, dry, hot environments, it's a lot harder. So in harsher environments, either hot and dry or cold and dry, regeneration is a lot more difficult. In those ecosystems, you need a lot more protection. So I mentioned how our species, our trees, cannot keep up with the rate of climate change. The velocity of climate change is orders of magnitude higher than what trees can migrate at, the pace that they can migrate at. And so we have to help them. We have to move them around. And so we've done that in this project. And what we found, first of all, is that these warmer genotypes, as we, as we move them north, they're actually doing okay right? It's warmed up enough that, that they're surviving in these warmer climates that we've created through climate change. So our ability to migrate stuff is actually pretty darn good. The second thing I want you to notice is uh, in these other figures, this is the driest and hottest site, and this is the most northern site. That most northern site is the northern limit of Douglas fir. Okay, Douglas fir is projected to actually migrate all the way up to the Yukon as climate changes over the next century. It's going to move if, if it can. It's going to move. But what this is showing is that it's, they're going to need to have protective trees in order for them to do that. So this is our 60% retention treatment and our 100% retention. And this is the clear cut. And you can see 
that the clear cuts are not sur the survival and the height growth is not as great as it is under these retention treatments. How important is this? It's hugely important because if you fly over the north of British Columbia, all we do is clear cut, right? That is all we do. If you fly over the north of across the boreal forest, all we do is clear cut. So we're actually setting ourselves up for a pretty tough time if we're going to be migrating species. This is a very compelling argument for changing the whole thing. And we need to change it quickly because climate is changing so fast. We need to shift away from clear cutting in the north to partial retention so we can migrate species so they have their mother trees to look after them to help them succeed in these colder and drier climates and therefore we can actually keep forests alive on the ground and productive and healthy and able to sequester carbon and house biodiversity. And my final point here is that keeping these old trees around here also mitigates fire risk. Right? They're not as fire prone as young plantations are. Those young plantations for, full of Douglas fir and lodgepole pine, it's like you could throw a match in them and they, and they just go up because they're so flammable. But old trees, they have thick bark, they have deep roots, they keep the forest moisture by bringing water up from deep down and they cause the, re the risk of fire to go down in a big way. And we've measured that in our project. And this just shows, and I'm, you don't have to understand this whole thing, but this is just like, if you look on the blue side over here, this is one of our sites, uh, the wettest site, and it shows that clear cutting the risk, and this is just risk of fire, is higher in our clear cuts by about double than it is where we retain these old trees. And it's because the old trees are less, less flammable. And it's also because there's less slash left around after, after harvesting as well. So there's multiple benefits to having these old mother trees for uh, storing carbon, for keeping healthy forests, for having a resilient forest in the future. So let me just go through these concluding remarks is that our forests are under a lot of stress. They're stressed out from climate change and they're stressed out from how we've managed them over the last hundred years. And this is only going to amplify in the future and they need our help. You know, we've gotten to the point where we can't, we can't just walk away. We've got to do something to help them migrate and be productive moving forward. And we can do that by retaining these old tree neighborhoods for enhancing regeneration, protecting the new seedlings coming up, uh, uh, housing the biodiversity and protecting those carbon stocks. And this is going to be especially crucial in harsher environments where seedlings, just like our babies when we grow, when they grow up in our little human families, they need our help, right? Um, those little seedlings, we're going to need the help of their mother trees. And so we, and especially on harsher sites where there's, there's more risks involved. And we can migrate these genotypes from, from warmer to, to colder climates as climate changes. We need to do it. It's, it can be successful, but it's going to be more successful if we leave the old trees around. In fact, we could be, you know, it could be a disaster if we don't keep those old trees around. It would be like, you know, creating a, like a parking lot to try to put your kids out on it. You just don't want to do that. You want to have a nice, healthy environment for them to be moved into. And how you retain those old trees, the patterns, it's all got to be based on the land. Watching the land, knowing the land, seeing what's going on, seeing how it's changing. That means having people on the land and knowing the land. It, do, it means getting out of our cities and going out and actually being part of the management of our forests. And finally, doing experiments like what I've done with the Mother Tree Project is wonderful for young people, obviously, for students. Um, they can go be part of it and feel like they're agents of change. I can't emphasize how important that is. But also we can go look at these experiments and we can say, okay, that worked and that didn't work and that worked before, but it doesn't work now. So we can use them to calibrate ourselves. We can use them to create models to project into the future and validate those models. And lastly, to motivate us to change because when we, when we can see what, what, what's positive and, and helpful, then we can, we can emulate that and build on it. So thank you very much, and I hope I hope that this presentation was uh, enlightening. Um, I hope that you can see how uh, my early work on plant communication um, and saving old mother trees is important, not just in healthy forests, but how we can use this knowledge to help us look after our forests in the future. So thank you so much.